Hi, my name is Barnes, and I'm here today at the Tech Talk stage at AASL, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, artificial intelligence and why it's important for uh, libraries, classrooms, and maker spaces, and more. So uh, I'm here today representing uh, our uh, publishing company, a nonprofit called Tumble Home. It used to be called Tumble Home Learning for those of you who were at previous uh, conferences. And uh, we are focused entirely on STEM education for our children. So another organization that I've been working with is uh, the Mass State Science and Engineering Fair, uh, which was uh, originally founded over 70 years ago by uh, AAAS and some professors at Harvard and MIT. And actually, we've been uh, continuously in operation at MIT that entire time. Uh, and every year, we represent uh, thousands of kids from across the state uh, who sometimes go on to national and, and international competitions, and uh, and overall, it's a very uh, it's a very uh, exciting and, and big event, and it really inspires lots of children. So I'll tell you a little bit why that's relevant. Science fairs in general are all about uh, curiosity. It's about uh, students wanting to uh, learn more about a subject of their own choosing, something that they're interested ab about. In my uh, own background, was um, I was I was interested in, in the subjects of uh, dinosaurs and paleontology and computing and uh, and DNA and, and other biochemicals, and uh, and so I wanted to do a project on that. And as you can see here in this slide, uh, I entered uh, uh, the Mass State Science and Engineering Fair as well as. Uh, a few other competitions. I made it to the international competition several times, and I met uh, a guy there who uh, became one of my, my best friends. Uh, and we're both, as you can see, clearly a, a couple of nerds there. Um, but my my project uh, was at the time uh, not not so clearly about artificial intelligence or about computers uh, necessarily, but uh, but there were some elements of that in there. So uh, my project was uh, was really focused on studying the evolution and transition of dinosaurs into birds. And many of you may have seen Jurassic Park and you may have seen uh, this uh, portion of the movie where there's a theory that you can take mosquito blood and you can extract some of the DNA uh, fragments from it and, um, and re-piece an entire dinosaur based on uh, reconstructing old DNA. Well, it turns out that uh, uh, DNA is made of some really uh, weak bonds. It's made out of hydrogen bonds sort of down the center. And, and are very easily pulled apart. So um, by design, that's, that's done uh, on purpose uh, uh, by nature to make sure that we can replicate cells so many times per day. But um, it's not very good when you're studying paleontology because uh, most DNA-based uh, studies in, in archaeology are only you know, tens of thousands of years old where the DNA is useful. But when you get back to millions or even hundreds of millions of years, uh, that becomes implausible. So uh, the work that I did went uh, in, in a slightly different direction. Although Jurassic Park came out around the time that I was starting my project, um, I ended up working in a, in a different field of, of biochemistry. And I actually spent a lot of years uh, as a field paleontologist. So I spent uh, actually the, the better part of a decade going out every single year uh, in the summers and, and any time the weather was good to, to try to dig for fossils. And in particular, um, I studied dinosaur eggshells. And the reason why that's interesting is because uh, eggshells, as it turns out, have a unique pattern. And if you can collect uh, a lot of data on their shapes and sizes of their, uh, their microscopic level patterns, as well as some, some biochemical uh, signatures, uh, when you collect all this data, you can then use it to, to generate patterns and patterns of data that can show you something about about evolution and how related certain species are to each other. Well, it turns out that uh, evolution can be traced using uh, this kind of a process. Now, uh, there's a lot of gaps in the fossil record and especially uh, the particular uh, types of animals that I was studying, there's, uh, there's not a whole lot of data, but using this approach, using math mathematics, you can fill in some of those gaps. And that's really the same approach, using statistics and probability and regression and, and uh, and a lot of pattern recognition and lots of big data. That's the same sort of um, thing that's done today with artificial intelligence. And um, although my, my, the title of my product didn't have AI or machine learning in it, um, it, did have, it did have quite a lot of, uh, of that in, uh, as part of the project. So I went on in, uh, in, 
Over the course of uh, four years, I went on to become a record holder, so a top national record holder for uh, science fair first place wins because I won uh, first place at all four regionals, all four states, uh, several international fairs, as well as the European Youth Exchange and, and, and several other special awards. So um, as a result of that, um, I was able to, um, to continue on my, my work and, and, and gain some credibility to, to work with science fairs, uh, not, just, uh, not just as a student and not just as a person who, um, who speaks well about them, but as a person who uh, goes out and raises money uh, for them and studies them, studies how science fairs uh, work to help kids um, not only understand science, but become more engaged and interested and inspired to, to go off and, and do, uh, to do science as a career. Uh, so I, I actually uh, ended up uh, reconnecting with my, my best friend from Science Fair days and starting a, uh, we started a business together that, uh, that focused on um, nothing to do with paleontology, but it focused entirely on uh, the idea of, of uh, advancing semiconductors, of using the latest technologies in material science to make chips faster and, and perform better. And that's a really critical function uh, when it comes to uh, to making and producing good uh, good artificial intelligence programs, because you need to not only be able to tr train data uh, to be able to get the data into the system, but you also be you have to be able to process that data very quickly. So chips are very very essential in this process. So I went on uh, to found a company with my friend that that focused on this field, and through that I became. Uh, more more knowledgeable about about AI. So, in the next slide, you can see why a uh, question why why listen to a guy with an evolution background, especially dinosaur evolution uh, and semiconductors. Um, why listen why listen to me about um, artificial intelligence? And actually, uh, it, it is the case that uh, uh, artificial intelligence is is based on natural intelligence. It's very closely linked. If you take a look at the graphs of uh, the growth of the semiconductor industry in terms of uh, transistors over time and the transistor density over time, and you take a look at um, brains, human, human brains and, and, uh, and human ancestors and how uh, brains have developed in terms of complexity and size, cell types and uh, other, other factors, um, you could see that these graphs are very, very similar. So. It actually takes a very cross-disciplinary approach uh, to take a look at something as, as complicated as artificial intelligence. So um, many people believe, in this next slide, you can see that because we started out, uh, according to evolution theory, we started out in a, in a very inorganic way. We started out as, as uh, elements that came together and uh, became maybe uh, possibly amino acids. And which formed uh, into cell structures that evolved over time, ultimately creating animals and creating human minds, uh, that the potential future for art intelligence might become artificial intelligence, might be uh, inorganic once again. It may be that uh, computers can be developed to the point where, where AI uh, at least matches human intelligence. And I think that uh, poses a lot of interesting um, possible future scenarios for us as, as, as members of of the human race. Um, so that's, that's something that we like to talk about uh, when, whenever we write books and curriculum um, and white papers about, about AI is uh, taking a look at the, the, the human considerations, the societal and ethical considerations. And I'll talk about that as well in a, a little bit. So uh, we're at AASL and uh, my uh, colleague and I are both uh, representing our, our, our booth here. Uh, and uh, I'll, I guess I'll, I, I would ask the, the crowd uh, who was present uh, if they can identify the person who's in this photograph here, uh, because he's actually at the booth. So uh, that's a clue. Uh, but this was a, a photograph, an old, uh, old photograph from a long time ago of a, of a person who later became an inventor. Uh, in the next slide, you'll see um, he, uh, he was a, sort of a tinkerer, a maker uh, back in his youth. Uh, there weren't too many science fairs in his area that were available to him. but. Uh, he basically did the same same thing. He, he, he did a lot of project-based learning, did a, did a lot with his hands and built airplanes. So he actually built a glider and, and jumped off his, uh, his family barn with it. And, uh, and he lived to tell the tale about that. So, uh, so obviously he was good at, at, at building things. 
In the next slide, you see uh, a person that he mentored. And many of you can guess who the person on the left is, uh, because that's Steve Jobs, the founder of, uh, one of the founders of Apple. So uh, the person uh, that I'm talking about is uh, Robert Noyce. He's the original uh, inventor of the silicon integrated circuit and the first uh, founder at Intel and the first CEO. So his inventions uh, spread obviously very far and wide. Their uh, semi uh, silicon semiconductor uh, uh, based circuits are, are everywhere. They're in, uh, they're in our cell phones, they're in our computers, they're in our cars, they're in our medical devices, they're everywhere. So uh, the reason why I mention this is because uh, Tumble Home Actually, its a, its background comes uh, from from this same family. So the person who was who was sitting on that guy's lap in that first photo is is Penny Noyce, and, and she's uh, the colleague that works with me at Tumble Home to help spread the word about uh, informal STEM education, project-based learning, and and why it's important for students to develop a sense, a personal sense, of STEM identity, and why they should feel like they are the heroes in their own story, why they're the protagonists in, in, uh, in their, hopefully their future life of STEM. So we, uh, we partnered together to form Tumble Home, uh, and many of our books are designed around the idea of students working on projects that ultimately could solve a world problem, or that's, that's our hope for them. Our hope is that students feel that they want to, um, they, they want to help the world, and then they want to do that uh, using science and engineering principles. So several of the books that we're promoting at AASL are uh, one book that, uh, that is, is coming out in 2020 uh, that I'm writing called uh, Get Ready for AI, and it contains some of the AI uh, subjects that, that I'll, I'll discuss a bit uh, later, um, and Inventors, Makers, and Barrier Breakers, which was actually funded by the, the Gordon Moore Foundation. Um, Gordon Moore was uh, Bob Noyce's partner when they first formed Intel, and Moore uh, is, is, of course, the, the person behind Moore's Law, which is the, uh, the famous semiconductor principle regarding uh, increasing transistor density over time and lower costs and better performance to, to price uh, ratios over time. So uh, we actually just did a giveaway of 150 of these inventors, makers, and barrier breakers books, and I think we have a few more to give away. Uh, and, uh, and we'll continue to, to do that at, at future events as well because we, we want that book to be, uh, we want that book to serve as an inspiration to a lot of other children. And in that book uh, are stories about, about both Bob Noyce and Gordon Moore, as well as many other uh, uh, diverse uh, scientists and engineers who've, who've made great discoveries or inventions throughout history. And another book we're here to promote is a book that is just about to come out called Microplastics and Me uh, by uh, our first uh, very young uh, child author, uh, a 12 year old, and her name is Anna Dew, and she's uh, one of the top rated uh, girls in, in middle school science fairs today as far as, uh, as far as national competitions. And her project also relates uh, to what uh, we're talking about because she built an ROV that can detect microplastics underwater using artificial intelligence. So, Today's AI requires uh, a lot of advances in both computer hardware and software. And that's why it's important to think about not only uh, AI in, the, in terms of coding it and uh, using a programming language to code it and using databases to store the data, but also the computer uh, chips and the computer architectures that are used to, uh, to perform all these AI algorithms. So here you see uh, an important slide. This is Gordon Moore, uh, along with uh, a, a wafer full of uh, Intel chips. And what you can see is a, a steady trend. This is Moore's Law. You can see a steady trend up. And notice that this is not linear at all. So, uh, so there's a, a, a significant amount of transistor density off to the right of this graph. And what's important about this is, um, over time, the more transistors that you have in a chip, uh, the more it resembles, or the more it potentially resembles, the architecture of the human mind. Because uh, brains are comprised of, of neurons, and these individual neurons, uh, in, in a sense, uh, communicate with each other in a, in a parallel way, just like parallel computing. We'll talk a little bit more about that. So, 
the chip, uh, the original integrated circuit chip that was developed at Intel was called the 4004. It was, uh, it only had 2300 transistors in it. And uh, what's important about that is today's chips have features, uh, which means small uh, transistors or, or other small uh, electronic components that are smaller than five nanometers. So there's a gigantic difference there. And uh, when you take a look at, at a lot of today's chips, there are uh, even different types of uh, chips out there. There's uh, uh, CPUs, central processing units, and GPUs, uh, graphics processing units, and, uh, and they, they serve slightly different functions, but they still have really uh, high densities of transistors. In them. And the more, um, the more computations you can perform in a small area, um, then effectively the smarter that chip is. And what's really great in recent news is that there have been some major announcements that uh, lead us to believe that AI has even more potential than, than we previously thought. Uh, Google has made a recent, recent announcement about achieving quantum supremacy, and Intel uh, developed a new platform called Pohoiki Beach, uh, which is comprised of these things called neuromorphic chips. And, and what's great about these, uh, these chips, uh, if you take a look at just, uh, just what that means, in, in this one system, uh, there are 8 million neurons what they call 8 million neurons, which are uh, effectively computing equivalents to human neurons, and 130 million synapses. And it's 10,000 times faster than a lot of other chips out there today. And why that's important is because it begins to approach the computing power of the human mind. Um, and you might ask yourself, well, well, what links these things together? How are they even equivalent? Well, it turns out that the human mind also uh, com cells communicate between each other uh, via electrons. And if you do a, a comparative analysis, there are a lot of similarities between brains and computers in terms of uh, in, in terms of equivalency and computing power. Uh, although there's there's far fewer neurons in computers today, the, the number is rapidly rising. Uh, there are a lot of operations that can be done by computers that are pretty equivalent to human mind. The relative power usage is it's still it's much smaller in brains, but uh, but uh, year by year, computer um, efficiency uh, continues to, to improve such that the amount of power goes down. And eventually, once all of these data points converge, we'll hopefully be at a point where computers can really crank out some, some high-level uh, artificial intelligence. So we're here today to talk uh, a little bit about why, uh, why libraries and teacher, teachers and schools and why uh, after-school programs and, and even uh, parents at home should should really be thinking about this and why it's important to begin teaching AI at a relatively early age. And the reason for that is um, we believe that that AI should um, should be taught in in all grades from K through 12. Um, and by that I don't mean the really complicated formulas you see. Uh, on the chalkboards when you look at pictures at, at MIT's AI lab. Those are obviously those are things that we, we want to teach later on in, in college, but um, but the concepts, the core concepts behind AI can be can be taught at pretty much every level. There's an initiative out of Carnegie Mellon uh, called AI for K-12, which has, has just uh, recently started the, the process of developing the first United States national standards in AI, and those are, uh, are due out next year. Part of that uh, that's, uh, that's been published already is the five big ideas in AI. And you can see here that there are um, you know, perception, representation, learning, natural interaction, and number five is important. It's a societal impact, which includes things like ethics and, uh, and the workforce, and what happens when AI becomes so powerful that it replaces humans and it replaces human functions in society. So that's an important thing, is you know, we don't just want to teach students skills, but we want to make sure students understand the context, the, the, the uh, societal and, and civilization context for, uh, for those, uh, those things they're learning. Um, and why, why teach AI at all? Well, the important thing is uh, AI is, is being uh, incorporated into so many pieces of software. Everybody has uh, some form of a Siri or Alexa or some kind of a voice recognition based software uh, that they uh, that they interact with on a, on, a, on a very regular basis, if not a daily basis, um, and that's continuing to uh, to increase throughout society. We're seeing more and more of that. So this is something that's going to be AI 
will be an element of everybody's job one day. And it's important for students to be prepared for the future. It's also important for American competitiveness. Uh, you know, Putin said just a few years ago, whoever controls AI will rule the world. Well, it is, it is important, not, not that we're worried about ruling the world, but it is important to make sure that AI is developed um, and, and uh, developed by, uh, by people who will, who will make ethical decisions about uh, how that AI is used and how that AI is incorporated into society. And of course, uh, career preparation. So um, AI and robotic systems are, are, uh, are certainly going to be more available in the future. And students who um, we hope want to want to become scientists or engineers might one day be able to have great careers by working in these related fields. There are already a number of countries who have uh, already adopted or proposed AI standards, uh, one including uh, Russia. And, uh, just uh, recently and uh, several years ago, China adopted AI standards, which include a lot of the basic skills that we, um, that we now are also proponents of, but, uh, but also, um, but also a, few, a few more, uh, so that there's some difference between the standards being proposed in other countries versus the, the United States. And another good reason to have students enter uh, uh, or get into the world of AI is students can perform well in, in uh, science and engineering competitions. So uh, getting back to science fairs, uh, this is a student at uh, the fair uh, that I was uh, involved with for many years. Um, and you can see here, he's, he's just won recently the top prize at Intel's International Science and Engineering Fair uh, for a project that uses AI to, uh, to help uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies discover more medicines. And if you look at these charts, you'll see that this is data that we've uh, collected recently uh, on international science fairs over the past six years. You can see that the, the, the terms machine learning and AI increased dramatically over the course of this, this uh, shown six year period. Uh, and it was at one point, it was at trace levels, and now it's, it's uh, a sizable amount. Here you can see in, uh, in middle school, so that last slide was, uh, uh, was high, uh, focused on high school students. This, this slide shows you the, uh, the number of Broadcom middle school national competition uh, projects that, that also incorporate AI or, or machine learning. And a few years ago, uh, there really weren't any at all, or, there, there, or if they, they did incorporate AI, they didn't do it in a, in a prominent way. And over time, that number is, is also increasing substantially as well. So we've been talking about AI in generalities, but what really is AI? Well, when you look back at human society, you see that uh, ever since the 1500s, and maybe even much earlier than that, humans have, have considered the, the idea that uh, having helpers, having, uh, having some, uh, uh, some thing to help humans in society perform their daily tasks uh, is a great benefit. It's really important, and people have had it in their imaginations. Here's a, an example from the 1500s uh, in Czech Republic. Uh, there was a, a story about a, a, a creature, a mythical creature, uh, called the golem, which was uh, made out of clay, and it, it uh, was designed to help collect water for, for the city. And, and as it was collecting water, it actually um, it outperformed itself. It, it collected a little bit too much water and, and actually flooded the city. And this is, a, uh, this is, of course, a legend, but it's very similar to one we, we have in modern times. In, in the 1900s, you see here uh, a good example of this in uh, The Sorcerer's Apprentice uh, in Fantasia. You see uh, Mickey asks a bucket to go and collect some water, and, and he does that, and he does it with enthusiasm and he, obviously he ended up flooding, uh, flooding the entire castle. So uh, we have similar stories in, in modern times uh, as well that, that, uh, that pertain to humans uh, imagining a world where, uh, where there are assistants, where there are agents that can, can help us, uh, help us in our daily lives. And when you think about AI, uh, this is something that, that, that is happening today. There are, uh, of course, fingerprint, um, recognition programs, there are voice rec, handwriting recognition programs, face rec, um, all these different things that are ever present in our, in our daily society. And how would you define something as intelligent? That's been a very important question. We all know that uh, you know, many animals uh, have, uh, have designed 
tools to help them with um, uh, gathering food. We know that some animals are able to communicate vocally. We know that some animals, uh, even animals that we normally wouldn't think of as intelligent, like uh, certain kinds of fish, are able to uh, use use the create and, and use tools uh, to open up uh, open up shells and clams and, and be able to to, uh, to to gather food. So we know that there is intelligence in the animal world. We know or we believe that humans are the most intelligent. But how would you define intelligence in the context of artificial intelligence? And there's a, an important piece of work done by Alan Turing in 1950 that um, that ended up defining this this uh, important piece of, uh, of AI uh, history. It's an important thing known as the Turing test, which is if you speak to uh, if you speak to something that's unknown, you, you, you're a you're a human. You're obviously assuming you're a human, and you're speaking to something uh, through uh, either a computer or a mechanism, some go-between, and you don't know if that that other thing is a human or an AI system. At the point where you can't tell the difference uh, as to whether or not that's a, a real human or an AI system, uh, that's that's called passing the Turing test. So that's the essential test of of true intelligence, artificial intelligence, and that is passing the Turing test. So some more AI basics. Uh, the problem with AI is it's taken so long to get here today. People obviously envisioned AI uh, a long time ago, and you see. You know, Alan Turing uh, was envisioning AI moving along quite quickly, and it turns out that it's it's now taken a, a lot longer than, than people thought. And why why has it taken so long uh, to develop high quality AI? Well, it turns out uh, that it's it's not just one thing, not one simple answer, but a combination of things uh, over time. Uh, it's really taken a, a large amount of time to develop the data models and to develop the processing power, but it's also taken a large amount of time to develop the big data, to, de to develop data sets, which are essential when you're training models. And so the convergence of all these things coming together is, is really what it takes to get AI to where it is today. And the acceleration of, uh, of all of these, uh, these components over time, and especially more and more in, in recent times, indicates that um, AI will will really have some, some major advances in, in the near future. So taking a look at one uh, example, there's a bunch of words on this slide, and maybe you could guess uh, in your own mind how many words you think there are in the English language. And as this is a library conference, I imagine a lot of people are, are familiar with this or have thought of this, this very thing before. Well, it turns out that um, if you guessed millions, or if you guessed hundreds or thousands, uh, you might be you might be wrong. It, it turns out that there there may be uh, a few hundred thousand. And if you look at other languages like Chinese, uh, for those of you who are familiar with other languages, um, there are a number of common characters that are used in Chinese, maybe uh, five thousand or so. So, relatively speaking, you know, human languages are are fairly limited. But when you think about what that means in terms of computing power uh, and, and what a computer has to do to understand or predict or classify language, it's a really difficult task. You look at uh, the, the, just the equation, the probability of, of, of predicting what the very next word I'm going to say is something like 1 over 200,000. Right? It's a very large number. And if you imagine uh, multiplying that out by an entire sentence, the statistics are are staggering. It's very, very difficult to uh, to be able to do this math, and that's a good that's a good example of why it's it, it takes so much computing power uh, to do things, even as basic as uh, as talk about natural language processing. So, in this next slide, you see an example of a chat, a chatbot, and this is something that we list in our resources page at Tumble Home. You can see that there's a conversation going on here between a human and a computer and it seems pretty nonsensical. Well, uh, it turns out that that's, that's pretty commonplace. It's very difficult for, uh, for chatbots, for, for any communication program to, uh, to speak to a human on a human level because of the, the sheer quantity of training that it takes and, and also developing context. So we try to have students at a very early age work with this concept, work with chatbots uh, using MIT's developed um, Scratch program, which is free, freely available, and try to understand what are all the different things 
uh, that a person might say to you and what are the, the possible answers you might give and try to create a, a, ch a chatbot system that is, uh, that's somewhat intelligible. So this is a, a fun exercise that we list on our uh, resources page. And, and so how does AI actually work? How could students even begin to think about uh, developing a system on their own? Well, part of it is, is actually quite simple. You train an algorithm, you develop data sets, and you, uh, you, you input unknown data, and you do that to the point where you come up with a model that then uh, can be used to unknown data. You, you, you then uh, use that to try to predict some sort of an outcome or predict some sort of uh, other piece of, of data. Well, we all know that it would, uh, it's a lot more complicated than that to write AI programs, but and you can see from this slide uh, that things like neural networks are comprised of many, many different layers, many uh, input layers, output layers, and hidden layers. And, and we know that this is not the kind of thing that you can easily teach to very young students. So we try to make this very uh, uh, simple. We try to make it very representative. So although in the next slide, it looks like uh, some of these examples of recurrent neural networks are, are pretty complicated. It's actually, it's actually much more um, simple to think about it in terms of examples. So examples of data that might be used might be talking, might be playing music, uh, might be uh, feeling emotions, or, uh, or for older students who know more about biochemistry, talking about DNA. Uh, these are examples of, uh, of things that, that you can research using recurrent neural networks. And of course, we want students to have some basic math skills. So we don't expect them to be able to do complex formulas like you would, you would expect to see in, in a, at a college level. Uh, but we do hope that students can, can look at graphs, try to understand and interpret what their meaning is. In this case, this is a, a, what we call a loss graph. And, and we hope that students are able to understand that uh, the fact that this, this shows a fairly rapid loss and then a, a sort of a plateauing of the data means that this particular system is very well trained. It's got a, a, a just the right amount of, of training. It doesn't have any too many false positives or false negatives, and and so this is the, the kind of representation we hope students, at, at least at some levels, uh, can can begin to understand. Maybe not even at uh, uh, at elementary and, and middle school levels, but at least um, beginning to think about beginning to think about these concepts. So here's an example of a really interesting and uh, very cool movie that I used to like when I was a, uh, a kid uh, called Short Circuit. And here you see uh, this is a, a robot that has somehow become, over time, uh, through some, uh, some means, uh, an artificial intelligence and sentient. It begins to think for itself. And the first thing that this robot wants to do once it becomes intelligent is it seeks input. And so it reads through lots and lots of books. And the interesting thing about, about this story is not only uh, the fact that it's, it's uh, very interested in books, which we all are uh, here at this conference, but, um, but the fact that it, it, it points to an important uh, fact about AI, and that is that you do need lots of data. You need large quantities of input in order for uh, AI systems to work. So uh, if a robot ever did become artificially intelligent, we can only naturally assume that they would want to go out there and read every book that has ever been written. Um, and much later than that movie, uh, we see that a, a real robot actually was created at MIT, MIT Media Lab, uh, uh, by uh, this young student who um, tried to create or emulate uh, a robot that would um, express human emotion. And although this wasn't true emotion, it it made a, 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 a it was formed a really good. Uh, concept. It made a, a really good um, point to show that this can be done. Uh, it's a proof of concept that uh, that a, a lot of uh, a lot of researchers around the world uh, initially thought maybe it wasn't a, it wasn't an important step in AI, but actually it was important. It was important for people to understand that the representation of AI is is also uh, just as important as as the algorithms behind it. And a more modern example, this is from just the past few years, you could see Boston Dynamics, uh, which is not too far away from our headquarters in, in Boston, Massachusetts, um, is able to develop uh, essentially very realistic humanoid uh, robots that can stand up on two legs and walk around very easily, um, and things that represent uh, animals and, and, and uh, can, can walk around very quickly and perform, perform tasks. 
Um, and this is a key step in, in humanizing AI. So things like language and things like robots and things like uh, uh, recurrent neural networks are, are, very, are, are very interesting and very important. But how about when you're talking about images, especially fast moving images or uh, live streaming data? And, and that's when you start needing something a little bit more complicated uh, called a convolutional neural network. Well, if you take a look at this next slide, you see uh, a, a, a program known as Object Detection API. This is a, a free program or a portion of a program that you can download. Um, uh, it's part of a, a, a platform called Google TensorFlow, and you'll find that on our resources page. You can see that it, it does a pretty good job of identifying people and uh, identifying cars, and it does that with a fairly low-cost um, computing system, something that you could actually do in your own maker spaces and, and classrooms and libraries. And then you take a look at, at this slide and you see just how much faster uh, that, you can, um, that you can identify objects using just a, a, a slight tweak on this algorithm. And then in this final slide, you see uh, just how much more uh, that you're able to identify uh, if, you, if you have the right computing power combined with the right type of, um, of software behind it. So th in this picture, uh, you see a lot of rapidly moving objects and the system is able to identify them in real time uh, with a very high uh, degree of accuracy, ex exceedingly quickly. And this is, this is the ideal for AI, and it only gets better and better as years go by. Um, here's another example. So here we're looking at uh, self-driving vehicles, and there are a number of sensors that enable this AI to work, and that includes uh, sensors that, that, uh, that detect proximity, sensors that detect uh, movement and, and, and motion, and of course, in this next slide here, you see uh, what Google has been working on for self-driving vehicles. They've obviously done an excellent job, and they've been uh, some of the strongest proponents of this technology. But in the next slide, you see just what we imagine the future of this technology uh, would look like. We imagine that it, that it would make transportation significantly more efficient, uh, faster, and, and hopefully safer for everybody. There are other examples of uh, modern AI that, that we go through in our resources, including medical advances, uh, where you're able to detect and, and classify certain illnesses using AI, uh, where you can use telemetry, uh, AI-based telemetry, to, uh, to avoid uh, lots of space junk and to be able to predict where asteroids and meteors are going to land. Uh, you can use it in, in climate and in weather modeling. You can use it to, uh, to predict what um, uh, what the weather might even look like years from now, um, of course, on a, on a global scale. So um, so AI is used in, in so many different uh, modern fields, but it's also used uh, in a number of different ways uh, that are actually really fun for kids. So here we go through some uh, quick lesson plans that we do with children uh, involving artistic, uh, or t art artistic forms of AI. So here uh, you see in AI art, we, we Although uh, we, we know that fractals are not really AI, we, we walk students through the concept of using computers and math models to generate art, to generate uh, art on its, effectively on its own. And what's interesting about that is students get the concept of, of using computers to generate something that in, in one way can imitate life. So uh, in the next slide you see uh, we have a a technology we use now called neural style GAN. And there's a, it's a, a, a general, generative adversarial network. Um, but there are, there are many programs that you can download that are very similar to this as well, some of which are linked on our, our website. And here you see a picture of a dog and a, uh, combined with a, uh, a picture of a uh, starry night. And it's able to generate an entirely new picture that, um, that it essentially transfers the style from uh, from one image to another. Here you get a, a close-up of that uh, of that painting. And here is our uh, headquarters in Newbury Street in Boston. And if you use this AI program, combine them together, you get an image like this that results in uh, a very artistic view of Newbury Street. And here is uh, my colleague Penny, uh, Penny Noyce, and uh, a picture of what she looks like sitting at the booth right behind me. Um, and Again, when we apply that uh, that that uh, that neural style, you can see that it transfers the, the style entirely to to her image. 
and so on and so on. We can take Monet and we can apply that also to Newbury Street. And of course, um, in the news we hear about uh, artificially intelli intelligently generated artwork being sold uh, by Christie's uh, for close to a half million dollars. And of course, we don't expect our students to all go out and make a half million dollars selling AI paintings, but it's certainly something fun to do in your library or classroom that you can also extend with, uh, with some hands-on lessons as well, where students can transfer the artwork to, to Canvas and, uh, and have fun with it. Here's another example of, uh, of something interesting and fun that you can do with AI. This is a Microsoft Xiao Ice, the first AI book in, uh, in the world was published in China uh, not too long ago, and, and Xiao Ice can, can make poetry, can make AI-based um, artwork and poetry together. And uh, we also encourage students to, to do that as well. We have programs that, uh, that allow students to input large volumes of words and see, uh, see what they're able to generate in terms of, of stories or, or poetry. Here's an example of a real-world example of this, where a Springer uh, publishing company actually published the first AI book uh, just this year. It was entirely generated using artificial intelligence. MIT has also a, a poetry competition that uh, uses, that is based on AI that, that uses this similar uh, combination of principles. You take a picture and you input that into your program and the competition uh, rules state that you have to generate a, a sensible and logical uh, piece of poetry. And as you can see here, a number of students have been able to pass that test and actually with, with great results. And here you can see a, 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 another great example of modern technology developed within the last year. Uh, these look like very high resolution pictures of people's faces. If you look at the next slide, you see many more people's faces. And if I were to ask you which of these people are real and which people are fake, you might have a hard time telling because they all look so realistic. Well, the actual the answer is they're, they're all fake. None of these people are real. They've all been uh, artificially generated using AI, uh, using large data sets, using, uh, uh, using pictures that have been trained, trained uh, the, uh, the system has been trained with a large volume of different um, people's faces. And these have been generated as entirely new people based on, uh, based on that data, based on that training data. And this next slide, it's a pretty important slide because it represents uh, the fact that AI is still today not perfect. You can see uh, this is a, a, a program that's uh, uh, now promoted pretty heavily by Google. Uh, they take your photos in your, uh, in your family album and they can combine them to kind of make a, a special composite photo. Uh, but as you can see in the next slide, uh, it doesn't always come out the way it's supposed to. So uh, what we're seeing here is a, is a human that's clearly about as tall as a, as a mountain. And although it looks very nicely photoshopped, the, the edges and the contrast look really nice, uh, it's clearly a, an issue with, with scaling. And that, um, and that relates to the fact that AI needs significantly more training uh, in order for, uh, for computers to completely understand the concept of, of human scale and scaling objects. Um, and there's a lot of people who have said that maybe the, the Turing test could be passed sometime soon, but clearly examples like that uh, lead a lot of us to believe that it's a, a little bit further off than, than we all hope. So maybe in your own mind you can uh, make your own prediction about when, the, when computers will finally pass the Turing test. A lot of people have said 2020. I think it'll be much further out than that. But um, we do hope that you do want to, to work with students to, uh, to inspire them to, to learn more about AI. So uh, we have on our website uh, put a number of free uh, activities and links to software that we hope that you can download and use yourself, use in, in, in your libraries, maker spaces, and, and classrooms to introduce students to this concept. And hopefully, uh, as the years pass, as, as uh, standards are, are developed, and as more, uh, more curriculum is developed around that, then uh, we'll, be, we'll be hopefully adding uh, significantly more to our, our resources uh, available online. One of the activities we, we really enjoy that we think 
students have a lot of fun with is uh, something we call happy faces. You can see on this slide, we use OpenCV and TensorFlow uh, to have students draw pictures of human faces and use that in conjunction with an image recognition, uh, an image processing system to uh, identify faces based on a limited training set of data that was developed uh, a number of years ago. So it looks about uh, to be the, the, the level of technology you'd find in a, in a camera or a cell phone that identifies faces from just a few years ago. So you can see how easy it is with this activity to fool, uh, to fool the system, to see uh, what features you need, what are the minimum features you need to be a human, and if there's any way that you can trick uh, the system by, by bypassing uh, all the data that's, that's been, been trained into that model. Um, and you can see here in, in, in this next slide, you see a, a, a picture of me with uh, a, a drawing that I made as well as uh, my own face. So you can see that it is able to identify features, but it's not able to identify every feature. And this, uh, this uh, is a, a program that we've done at a, a number of locations around the world and pretty much everywhere we go, in uh, Japan, uh, China, um, all, all different parts of, of the states and Europe. Students always have happy faces at the, at the end of doing this activity. So we hope you'll try it. We hope you'll have fun with it. Um, another thing that we, we really like to promote is uh, AI music. And, and that's just because it's fun. It's fun to do. And uh, we, we suggest you, you download a program called uh, Magenta, uh, which is also part of uh, or uh, developed in association with, with Google TensorFlow. And uh, uh, typically, it's it's best to use a, a Linux system for this. But there are uh, there are experiments you can do without even downloading the software. And this is something we also link to to make it very easy for you to incorporate into your classes without even downloading software. On the next slide, you can see uh, an image of something from the Google TensorFlow um, AI experimental playground, and this lets you. Uh, play with programs. You can use your keyboard to play notes and see what happens, see what kind of response you get. There are uh, a number of other uh, programs that you can, you can also work with that, uh, that we highlight on our resources page. And as you can see in this last slide, these resources can be found at tumblehomebooks.org slash AI resources. Uh, we hope you'll go there and, and try a little bit of everything. And um, as, as we are at a, a library conference, of course, we're, uh, we're promoting books and all of our book sales go to uh, developing more programs, which we can hopefully make uh, available uh, to more communities that, that need to learn uh, more about uh, STEM topics that, that have a, a need for, uh, especially at, uh, high needs districts that have a, a need for resources to be given to them. Uh, at discounts or, or freely, and this is something we strongly believe in at, at Tumble Home. Um, and we're uh, right now we're located uh, near the Tech Talk stage, so hopefully, if, uh, if you're still at the conference, you can you can come on over and, and visit us. And uh, if not, please uh, visit our website and contact us through through that. That's tumblehomebooks.org. Thank you very much.